worship service this morning. So welcome, friends in person, friends online. It really feels like we're making the transition to fall here a little bit outside. Uh, families getting in their last vacations and activities, school about to start and all of that. And uh, it got me thinking of um, transitions uh, in life. And I thought over my career, I've had the privilege of serving in military communities and learned early on uh, that a church in a military community, uh, it, one of their jobs is to get good at saying hello and at saying goodbye, uh, because military personnel and families come and go every, every few years. But even in non-military communities, I believe it's the church's job to be people of blessing, who learn to say hello and learn to say farewell um, and bless people as they go because we're a mobile society, and because people follow God's call and say, here I am, Lord, um, as they respond to God's call and their leading, and God's leading in their lives. So we want to bless them as they embark on the next adventure uh, of their lives. So we're in the middle of uh, some farewells and hellos these few weeks here at Maplewood Presbyterian. As we said, thank you and farewell to Jonna last week, as we say thank you and farewell to Michelle and her family this morning. And as we say hello next week to our new music director and accompanist, Ian Alvarez. Uh, we'll talk about uh, hellos next week. You'll hear more about it in the weekly email. Uh, but for now, this morning, we'll have a celebration uh, for Michelle's Ministry of Music uh, in the context of our worship together and um, in the social hall afterwards. But mostly in the context of a triune God who welcomes us and in turn then sends us out to be as ambassadors of love, even as we experience God's love in our worship together. So please join me in our call to worship this morning. We are here to worship a remarkable God. The love of God welcomes us. The grace of Christ awaits us. The joy of the Spirit enfolds us. Don't come as the duty-bound, come as the truly free. Don't come as petitioners, come as those who are already heard. Don't come as interlopers, come as invited guests. Don't come as the outsiders, come as much-wanted children. The love of God emboldens us. The grace of Christ redeems us. The joy of the Spirit uplifts us. Come as the joyful, come as the eager, Come as the thankful, come as the recipients of amazing grace. The love of God overflows our hearts. The grace of Christ liberates our spirits. The joy of the Spirit sings in our minds. Let's stand together and sing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee.
Join with me in the unison prayer of praise. Holy God, we desire to know you better and more fully. We ask you to reveal more of yourself to us, to take us beyond the confines of familiar habits, to free us from the restrictions and distortions of our language, to expand our understanding of you so that we can love you wholeheartedly, we can communicate you faithfully, and we can reflect your image to a world that needs you. Amen. You may remain seated for our next hymn. Join with me again in the prayer of confession and reflection printed in your bulletin and on the screen. Loving God, we confess that despite our best efforts and intentions, we have failed to consistently live in ways that bring honor to your name and bring blessing to our neighbors. Through the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit, free us from attitudes and actions that do not lead to life for others and for ourselves. Strengthen us in love and help us to delight in doing your will. Let's take a moment of silence to bring our thoughts, our confessions, and our prayers to the Lord. Friends, hear these words of assurance. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
Therefore, since we have been reconciled through faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And now let's take a moment to pass the peace of Christ, being mindful of each other's um, boundaries and needs during this time of following up of COVID. The gospel this re reading this morning is from Mark 8, verses 27 to 33. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, 
But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Heidi. Well, this morning I'm returning to a, a text uh, from Colossians chapter 1 um, that speaks of a very big and uh, a, a very cosmic Christ. This is Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20. Speaking of Jesus Christ, Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, heady stuff, huh? <laughs> and heavy stuff, too. Um, this is a passage that I like to say is dense with calories, like fruitcake. And like fruitcake, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, it's a rich, high-calorie passage, spiritually speaking, and theologically speaking. So I'd like to reread this, but using Eugene Peterson's message translation, which I think will open up some of what is being said here. Here's how he translates this passage. We look at this sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at this sun and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of human authorities and angels, Everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning, leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, and everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. I love that translation, especially the phrase that Jesus is spacious, he's roomy, and all of the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe get fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies. Uh, it's beautiful. Taking all of what is said here, this is a unique perspective about Jesus Christ. Uh, it's large, it's global, um, it's massive, and like I said, it's cosmic. Uh, and more theological in nature than most of what's written in the New Testament. Normally, Paul in his letters would refer to a specific teaching of Jesus or a principle of Jesus' life and ministry and apply it to the church or to a, a conflict in the church and how God's people therefore need to live. This power-packed passage, however, 
A phrase practically is a, a concise doctrinal statement or even a poem or a song that the early church may have sung about the eternal Christ is global in nature. Paul goes big, and he goes big in a hurry. Uh, this is grand and lofty, and it's beautiful. What impresses me in this is that Paul does not downsize Jesus. In fact, he does the opposite. He makes him bigger. He doesn't try to make him fit into some neat and tidy little package that makes him tame. Paul says that Jesus is it. He is everything from beginning to end. And everything, and here Paul names thrones, rulers, dominions, powers, everything is subject to him. There is nothing that isn't subject to him. Think about that. Whether the one occupying the throne is called prime minister or president or queen, or king, supreme leader, or CEO, or pastor. Everyone and everything is subject to him. This Jesus is big. And so this morning, I'd like to ask the question again, how big is your Jesus? Or perhaps the question could be put this way, the way Jesus put it to his disciples. Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? This is worthy of reflection from time to time as we check in with ourselves about our faith. Who is Jesus Christ to you? Who is Jesus Christ to me? Uh, What difference does Jesus Christ make? And not just to you and to me personally, but to the world. Now, I'm not going to do what many pastors are tempted to do when we get to passages like this uh, from the New Testament, like the one Heidi read. I'm not going to present you with a 15-point doctrinal lesson about Jesus Christ and tell you you'd better stick to it or else, right? So, you know, so we don't have to excommunicate you or something like that, you know, send the theology police after you. I don't want to do that. I will say that rather than give you a list of doctrinal statements and beliefs that you are expected to adhere to, I want you to know this Jesus, to trust this Jesus, to follow this Jesus, and receive the essential things that Scripture teaches about Jesus and from Jesus. I want you to discover for yourself who the living Christ is to you and for you and for the world, maybe even for the universe, since Paul talks about that. After all, this is the cosmic Christ we're talking about. And we are, in this morning's readings and a few other places in the New Testament, invited to see him as cosmic. And by cosmic Christ, we mean the Christ who existed before creation and at creation, The Christ who makes cameo appearances in the Old Testament in the form of an angel, or a visitor to people like Abraham, or in the book of Daniel and his companions in the fiery furnace, where it says that someone like a son of man appeared in the furnace with them. And of course, we're talking about the resurrected and ascended Christ, who in the book of Revelation says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the living one. When we talk about the cosmic Christ, we're talking about the more mystical experiences of Christianity and of spiritual practice, where we see this eternal Christ pervading all created things and people. Compared with the historical Jesus, who lived on earth for a time as a human being, and said personal things like, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That's the historical Jesus, the personal Jesus, The human Jesus, who ate real food and needed real sleep and got his hands and feet dirty, like all of us, and relates to us in our humanity, including our pain and in our suffering. The cosmic Christ is what we see and experience when, for an example, on a dark, clear night away from the city lights, we look at a sky full of stars and go, wow, and something in us shifts and changes. And the cosmic Christ is what we see and experience when we look into our dear pet's face. (laughs) And they look back at us, and we go, wow. And something in us shifts and changes. Or we look at the beauty of a flower in bloom, or the magnificence of the Olympic mountains, and go, wow. And something in us shifts and changes. This is Christ in all created things, including people. When we talk about the cosmic Christ, we're talking about the Christ who is bigger than Christianity and beyond Christianity. And I'll come back to this in a moment. Think of it this way. We have known and followed Jesus for 2,000 years. At birth, he was named Jesus, and we've known him as Jesus since then. 
However, the Christ has existed from eternity. Every Christmas Eve, we read from John 1 where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him and through him. And that passage concludes with, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what John is saying is, this is the eternal cosmic Christ becoming the human Jesus, entering history. And maybe this is all to say that Christ is not Jesus' last name. The Jesus we know is Jesus the Christ. And what Paul is doing here in Colossians 1 is inviting us to occasionally look above and beyond the historical Jesus to get a glimpse of the magnificence of the eternal Christ, in whom the fullness of God dwells the co-creator of all that is. This gaze into the bigger picture saves us from thinking small and having too small a picture of Jesus, too limited and limiting a picture of Jesus. Uh, British Episcopalian J.B. Phillips wrote a book in the early 1960s titled, Your God is Too Small. Uh, For our modern needs, he's making the case, we need a big Jesus. We need a Jesus as big as he really is, as described in Scripture. Pastor and author Brian McLaren, who was born in the mid-1950s, talks in one of his books about the seven Jesuses I have known. The seven Jesuses he has known through his experience in his family growing up, through his school years, college, and adulthood, and because of his work and his close relationships that have introduced him to more Jesuses. So he lists the seven Jesuses he has known as the conservative Protestant Jesus, the charismatic Pentecostal Jesus that he learned in college, the Roman Catholic Jesus that he learned in grad school at a Catholic university, the Eastern Orthodox Jesus from his travels to the East, the liberal Protestant Jesus, the Anabaptist or the Baptist tradition Jesus, and then the liberation theology Jesus from his travels to South America. And perhaps in your life, you've had several Jesuses you've known over the years. Maybe not seven, but more than one. Brian McLaren never said that there is one he thinks is right or best, because they all contain good and true parts of the Jesus story and have some good and right expressions in and through the church. They all bring something unique to the table of the Jesus feast. And Brian McLaren has said that his faith has actually become simpler as he's gotten older. And he simply wants to stay in a humble place about this cosmic Christ and keep exploring more about the one in whom the fullness of God dwells. And do it from a place of wonder rather than a place of having to be right or to get it exactly right. And he makes it clear that he doesn't think it's a good idea to just combine all of the Jesuses he has known, you know, all the good parts of all the different Jesuses and the the traditions and denominations, you know, like putting them as I describe in a blender, and combining them into a Jesus smoothie, you know. Um, Each expression and each tradition needs to find its best self, so to speak, and live it out with integrity and with humility, and with kindness and understanding, and acceptance of and cooperation with others, while trying to keep the big picture. And no matter which expression a human being finds most meaningful, the point is, is that Jesus Christ is the center of it. That's the point. Christ is at the center and at the edge, and above and below and all around. Um, I had a seminary professor, a Marianne Thompson, who used to say, Christ is both the center and the circumference of everything. That kind of messes with my mind, um, but I like it. Christ is both the center and the circumference of everything. And that's what Paul is saying in Colossians. Christ is both the center and the circumference of everything. So let's keep the big picture, along with the personal. Keeping the big picture of the cosmic Christ helps us with interfaith dialogue and understanding, because we see the Christ who is beyond Christianity, who is bigger than the tribal Jesus. You know, the tribal Jesus who is only for a small group of people and is against others maybe even warring with others. In Paul's words, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, which would include other religions, in my view. He is spacious. He's roomy. Everything finds its proper place in him without crowding. 
The Apostle Paul himself is a good example of someone who, in the book of Acts and in his letters, is not threatened by other religions or who sees Jesus as a tribal Jesus who is against others. Rather, the Apostle Paul looks for the kernels of truth and the essential expressions of God and Jesus, even in other faiths. And he is looking at the longings of the human heart and how Jesus Christ fulfills our true longings. Um, Acts 17 gives a great example of this. When Paul is in Athens and he observes all these shrines uh, and, and all these things dedicated to the gods, the various gods, including one that says, to an unknown god. And he attempts to proclaim the bigger picture and point to Christ. Here is the one who, you're, who you are searching for. Here is the one who is the fulfillment of human search for meaning. Why the world is here and why you and I are here. Now, I don't want to say that all religions are equal or that they're all the same. That's kind of patronizing uh, to adherents of each religion, to tell them their faith is no different than others, that they're all the same. I do want to say that Jesus the Christ, who is above all and before all and after all and in all, mysteriously and lovingly holds it all together. And to use Paul's remarkable words, God through Christ reconciles to himself all things. So even if we wrestle with whether or not Jesus is the only way to salvation or to God, we can trust that God through Christ will reconcile everything in the end. It's not our job to categorize or judge others, but to bear witness to what we know in Christ to be true and meaningful and beautiful and then to be ambassadors of reconciliation, and to have peace and to be people of peace, knowing that God in Christ has things handled. You know, lately, with everything going on, I've been coming back to a line in the Psalms that keeps, helps me keep the bigger picture. It's Psalm 75, verse 3. This is a great one for a sticky note on your computer screen or your television if you're watching too much news. Psalm 75, 3 says, When the earth totters and all its inhabitants... It is I who keep its pillars steady. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep its pillars steady. Even if it doesn't look like it all the time, God steadies the world and steadies us through Christ who is with us always. When I read about this cosmic Christ from our passage this morning and how all things were created for his purposes and how he holds all things together, and to quote the message translation, Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies. When I read that, it gives me hope. Hope that this big God in Jesus the Christ holds the entire world and us in his hands. Pandemics don't have the last word, nor do politics. Only Jesus Christ, who holds it all together. There isn't anything he hasn't seen before or handled before. Um, I had a friend in um, seminary, uh, Heidi and I went to Fuller Seminary in Southern California, who grew up in Los Angeles. And the L.A. Bowl, if you've been down there, is huge. And that world was Tom's life. He hadn't really traveled outside of L.A., Uh, He loved it there and loved his life in Southern California. Well, one day during an Old Testament theology class, we were studying Abraham. And God's call to Abraham to become the leader of a new people, the father of many nations and all of that. And Abraham, like many people God called, was reluctant at first. So part of God's convincing Abraham to go on this adventure was to take him outside at night and have him look up at the stars and say to him, and think of how brilliant the night sky would have been several thousand years ago. So he's looking up at this brilliant night sky, and God tells him, see all these stars? So shall your descendants be, as numerous as the stars in the sky. Well, my friend Tom, as we're sitting there in class, said he always thought that that promise was lame. Because in LA, whenever he looked up at the night sky, he could count maybe 10 stars. Because of smog, you know, the days of intense smog and and a lot of light pollution. So he said somewhat jokingly, so Abraham's going to get about 10 descendants. Big deal. And I said, dude, he was a surfer, so I'm speaking his language. Dude, you need to get out of town more. 
Come up to the Pacific Northwest or at least drive east to go to the desert, you know, or go north to the Sierra Mountains or something. Well, long story short, he did. He went camping and he came back and he said, dude, the universe is like massive. I said, yeah. He had an experience of just how big this God is who made heaven and earth, and it began to transform him. And we all need experiences like this from time to time to get, get us out of our heads, uh, to get away from the headlines and all the shiny objects, to catch a glimpse of the eternal cosmic Christ. And it doesn't have to be nighttime stars. It can be the brilliance and complexity of one flower or the amazing complexity of a stick bug. Where's Kathy? <laughs> from the pet blessing we had a week ago Saturday, Kathy has two stick bugs she brought to be blessed. Pretty amazing, actually, just to see these incredible creatures. Things that make us go, wow. And this vast, amazing God becomes knowable, who is both mysterious and magnificent at the same time, worthy of our gratitude and praise and wonder. So let's sing about that as we sing, Immortal, immortal Invisible, God Only Wise. We want to take a moment now to say thank you and express our uh, well wishes and blessings um, to Michelle, who's been on staff with us these past four and a half years. Uh, and when Michelle came on staff four and a half years ago, um, it was a gift of perfect timing. Um, our accompanist director at that time had left to teach grade school full time, so there's a little theme going here. And our interim accompanist director was filling in nicely, and really there was no hurry um, in our search. However, he got seriously sick with pneumonia, and so we mutually decided to re-up um, our efforts to find a permanent accompanist music director because he needed to step away. Now, I had taken all of our ads down because no one, there were no replies, or at least I thought I had taken the ads down because we weren't receiving any replies on applicants. But one day I received an email out of the blue from someone who said she would be relocating to our area and had seen an ad uh, for an accompanist music director, mysteriously to me because I thought I had taken the ads down, and said 
did we still need someone for the job? Well, yeah. <laughs> Michelle's resume was excellent. Her experience revealed someone who had played in a number of different settings and musical environments, playing a variety of music. And when she auditioned, it was clear uh, that she had superb skills. But just as important, she had a kind and thoughtful heart and would be fun and easy to work with and a great addition to the staff team, which has been true these past four and a half years. You were just who we needed during this time, and I believe that we were just who you needed Yep, during this time as well these past few years. So I'm going to invite you to come down here for a moment. behind the organ. I know. Yeah, she likes to hide back there. Have you come out just for a moment? So we want to... All right, is this Dan? Can I have this a little louder? Thank you. There we go. So we want to say thank you and blessings to you and your new adventure of teaching first graders. Yay. <laughs> Starting this fall, that'll be fun. Thank you for your gift of music. Thank you for your your presence. So we bless you and wish you well with a couple of gift cards, one to Walls of Books in Issaquah, which is close to home, which not only has Walls of Books, but some teaching supplies, I'm told. Yeah, it's this, so thanks to Kathy Draper for that suggestion, and thanks to Heidi for the other suggestion of another gift card to Lakeshore Learning in Bellevue, which does have lots of teaching supplies or just fun stuff if you want to just do fun stuff. So we want to bless you in a way that's appropriate to a, an accompanist music director leaving. So I'm going to have you step up here. David's going to step to the piano. And we have a song that we're all going to sing. You've all seen probably Sound of Music. So you know the song Edelweiss. You know the tune? So we're going to sing a blessing song. The words are on the screen. And we're going to sing this. Stay there. One more.
There will be cake in the social hall because there's always cake when we celebrate. <laughs> and in the narthex are these cards, if you can write a note, um, pun intended, um, for Michelle um, in, the, in the narthex there. There's a table where you can write a note to her. And now we're supposed to pray. Um, so <laughs> let's do that. We'll end with, uh, conclude with the Lord's Prayer. God of life, God of the changing seasons, and of the seasons of our lives, we thank you for your presence with us in each moment, in every change, in every circumstance, in the joys and the struggles, in the challenges and times of indecision, in the times of peacefulness and clarity. We affirm once again that there is nothing you haven't seen, nor anything you haven't handled before. Therefore, we offer our gratitude. We pray for the needs of each person here today in person and worshiping online. There are some in our service who are confronting physical challenges. There are those who are facing uphill battles of various kinds. Other, others of us know the daily challenge of caregiving of others, which sometimes feels like a privilege but can also be exhausting. But each one of us brings a life story to this moment with hurts or hopes, disappointments, and dreams. We pray in these moments for your touch to encourage and uplift in all the ways we need you. And every day we're confronted with the uncertainty and the suffering in the world around us. It is tempting to succumb to fatigue and cynicism, but you have given us hearts to care. And so our prayers encircle those who have too little food in a country that is associated with plenty. For those who face the challenge of inadequate housing, those who struggle with financial insecurity, and those whose lives are tenuous in so many ways, may we become the answer to their prayers, God. God of all compassion, we know that there is nothing that can separate us from your love. Seasons will pass and times will change, but your faithfulness still remains. As we meet the challenges of the week ahead, help us to rest deeply in that hope. Lord, transform our lives more and more to reflect the peace and joy and strength we know as we place our trust in you. And as we pray now the words of Jesus, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, God Be With You Till We Meet Again.
Now, friends, go in peace, and as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you, that you might live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love now and forevermore. And all of God's beloved said, Amen. Amen.